All right. Praise God. Let's get one more Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to continue in our study of Ephesians chapter 1. And we're still focusing on verses 1 through 14. So the last two weeks, we really just spent all introduction, just talking about the context of the letter, really the larger picture of Paul's worldview, right? And how he sees the body of Messiah as a whole. So this week, we're going to get more into the weeds. Uh, we're going to go start going verse by verse, starting in verse 3, and we're just going to dig in, okay? And I'd better take note of the time right now <laughs> before we start that. So it is 11.54, and that means... Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. So let us, let us begin. In verse 1, Paul, an emissary, yours may say apostle, an emissary of Messiah Yeshua through the will of God to the holy ones who are at Ephesus and the faithful in Messiah Yeshua. Grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in Him, in the Messiah, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and without defect before Him in love having predestined us for adoption as children through Yeshua the Messiah to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His desire, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He freely gave us favor in the Beloved. In Him we have our redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Him, in the Messiah, to an administration of the fullness of the times, to sum up all things in the Messiah, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth in Him. Your, your translation there may say to unite all things in the Messiah. Other translations say to sum up. You could almost think about it as God consolidating all things under the rule of the Messiah. Things that are in the heavens and the things on the earth in Him. We were also assigned an inheritance in Him, having been foreordained according to the purpose of Him, who does all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we should be to the praise of His glory, we who had before or first hoped in the Messiah. In Him you also, having heard the word of the truth, the good news of your salvation, in whom having also believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a pledge of our inheritance to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. Amen. Keep in mind the, the idea, the framework for interpreting this passage that I brought forward the last two weeks that's been put forward by Messianic Jewish scholarship, talking about when Paul is referring to us and we in verses 3 through 12 and all the things that the Messiah has done for us, it's possible to read this that Paul is describing what God has done for His people, the people that He chose, the Jewish people. Okay, Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh, as he says in Romans 9. Okay. And then in verses 13 and 14, it's as if Paul pivots and refers specifically first to the Ephesian community, which are, he's writing to the Gentile believers in Ephesus, and then to expand on that to all of the nations who put their trust in the Messiah Yeshua, that they are being brought in as partners alongside of the Jewish people and fellow heirs of the blessings of eternal life. 
With that, let's focus today on verse 3. We'll see how far we can get today. I make no guarantees. But let's read again Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, who has blessed us in the Messiah with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In the Messiah, or through the Messiah, God has blessed Israel with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I want to bring forth an idea about this passage by comparing our Master Yeshua, the final Redeemer, I want to compare Him to the first Redeemer. Okay, Moses. Moses. Paul paints a picture that through the Messiah, the blessings for Israel that are in the heavenly places have been brought down to them. Okay? That this has been accomplished in some way for the people of Israel through the Messiah. Now keep in mind at this point, the Messiah has ascended to heaven. Right? He was raised from the dead and he's gone up to heaven. And through this ministry of the Messiah, blessings have come down upon Israel from heaven. This reminds me of an interesting story, an interesting comparison. And I've got a lot of scriptures today. I'm going to announce every verse reference, but I'm not going to give us time to flip through because I think it would just take too much time. But remember, we record every message. So if you miss something, let me know. I'll get you my notes. It's on the recording. So as I say the verse reference, I'm just going to go in and read it. Okay, just so we can keep going today. But I want to talk a minute about Moses and read for you Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. In this passage, God has freshly brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and now they're at the foot of Mount Sinai, ready to receive the covenant with God. Okay? Exodus 19, verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim, and they came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. Okay, You could also translate that last phrase that Moses ascended up to God. Okay, Now, if from the plain meaning of the text, what would that mean to say that Moses ascended up to God? He went up the mountain, right? But it's fascinating. The, the traditional view of this statement that Moses went up to God, okay, that's been preserved by rabbinic tradition, is very rich, and I think it gives us a picture of what our Master, the Messiah Yeshua, has also accomplished for His people. I want to share with you a brief snippet. This is from a section of the Talmud, from a tractate called Shabbat, and it says this, Rabbi Yehoshua, the son of Levi, said, When Moses ascended on high, which is an idiom for saying, when Moses ascended to heaven to receive the Torah, the ministering angels said before the Holy One, blessed be He, they said, Master of the universe, what is one born of a woman doing here among us? I.e., what is a human doing here? The Holy One, blessed be He, said to them, He came up to receive the Torah. Wow! Wow! Now, this is fascinating. Again, this is a traditional story. This is a traditional interpretation of the passage that says Moses went up to God. There's a viewpoint as if to say that Moses literally went up to heaven to bring the Torah back down for the people of Israel. Right? 
Psalm 68, verses 18 and 19 is also interpreted in this light. And this will be a passage that most of us have heard in, in church uh, from time to time. This is a passage, the one that I'm about to read to you, that's actually quoted by Paul later on in chapter 4 of Ephesians. Okay? But listen to this. This is Psalm 68, verses 18 and 19. God's chariots are myriads upon myriads. Thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in His holiness. You have ascended on high. You led captivity captive. You have received gifts for men. Yes, from the rebellious also, or for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell there. Fascinating. Like I just mentioned, this verse, have you heard that before? You've ascended on high, you've led captivity captive, and you've received gifts for men. Okay? Paul quotes this in Ephesians 4. He says it a little bit differently, but he's quoting this passage and he's referring to the Messiah who ascended up to heaven, okay? received gifts from on high for his people Israel, and then later on, by extension, for the nations, and he sent it back down. Okay? The traditional interpretation of this passage also attributes this verse to Moses. And they interpret this passage as referring to Moses ascending up to Mount Sinai, but not stopping there. That Moses, it is as if he went up to God. And it says he led captivity captive. Almost as if he received the Torah, which belongs in heaven. It's heavenly. And he led it like a captive back down to earth for the people of Israel. And it says he received gifts for men. And this passage is interpreted to, as if to say that the Torah is this great gift this great spiritual blessing that has come down from heaven that Moses brought down. It was brought down from God to His people Israel through the agency of who? Moses. Okay. I just think this picture of Moses ascending up and receiving this gift and bringing it back down is so beautiful because I think by way of analogy, it paints a beautiful picture of the Messiah Yeshua and what He accomplished for Israel and for the world. And for that, I want to close on this thought, on this particular thought, by reading to you Acts chapter 2, verses 29 through 33. Now this, Acts chapter 2, this is that, this is that monumental moment. Okay? This is... Seven full weeks right after Yeshua has, after that fateful Passover where Yeshua was crucified, after he rose from the dead, now it is the festival of Shavuot. It's the festival of Pentecost. All of the Jewish people from so many nations are gathered together, right? It says God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven have gathered at the temple to worship God there. And what happens? All of a sudden, noise and wind and fire from heaven that comes down on the heads of the apostles and on the, the believers who are gathered there. And they just begin to speak in all the languages of mankind and they're proclaiming the praises of God, right? Awesome, right? And people are going, what in the world is this? And Peter, praise God, filled with Ruach HaKodesh, filled with Holy Spirit, gets up and says, let me explain this to you, okay? Let me explain this one time to you. And he says, Acts 2, verse 29 through 33, he says, Brothers, I may say this to you with confidence about our father David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on, the, on his throne, 
David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Yeshua God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted, or ascending, going up, lifted up to the right hand of God, He received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, and He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Much in the same way, much in a similar way, that the traditional interpretation sees Moses as going up to heaven, receiving this incredible heavenly spiritual blessing, and bringing it back down for the people of Israel. In the same way, Peter describes the Master Yeshua, that when he rose from the grave, that he was lifted up, he ascended to heaven, to heavenly places, and received a special gift from the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he then brought down for his people Israel. And later on, we find that also this beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit is poured out on Cornelius and on the nations as well. So, Yeshua pours out a spiritual blessing from the heavens. That is the Holy Spirit upon His people Israel. The Holy Spirit that the Hebrew prophets promised would come. The Holy Spirit that, remember, I've mentioned this in the past weeks, the Holy Spirit being poured out is a sign of really the impending coming, the, the imminent coming of the Messianic era. Okay? Because the Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh is a sign. It's a, it's a, it's a hallmark of the Messianic era when everyone who gets to participate in the Messianic era has the Holy Spirit, they have the knowledge of God. No one in that day has to teach their neighbor, no God. He says, they will all know me. Okay? All of Israel, all of God's people, all who call on His name as well will be prophets in that day. The Holy Spirit that was poured out in Acts chapter 2 is a down payment on the messianic era that is to come. It's not all the goods in and of itself. It is the goods, but it's a reminder that the messianic era is coming. The fullness is coming. And later on in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, well, maybe, maybe next week we'll see. Paul will talk about the Holy Spirit as being a down payment, right, for the inheritance that is to come. The inheritance being the messianic era. Okay, what maybe if we grew up in in um, certain denominational background, if you call it the millennial reign, right, the reign of Yeshua the Messiah on the earth. Praise God, He is truly the prophet like Moses. He is the final redeemer, who is who has come and is coming again to redeem His people Israel and all those who are called by His name into His kingdom. We're going to go just a little bit farther today. I think we'll go into verse 4. Yeah, and we'll probably stop there this week because I think that's plenty for today. But Ephesians chapter 1, and I'll, I'll read verses 3 and 4 together just so that we can get the flow of the passage. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Messiah, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and without defect before Him in love. Notice verse 4 again. It says, even as He chose us in Him. This is fascinating. Because remember, 
for the purposes of this study, we're reading Paul's words as if he's saying he chose us, that he's chose the people of Israel in who? In the Messiah before the foundations of the world. Before the foundations of the world. The apostles speak about the Messiah as the Lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. Okay? They, the apostles didn't necessarily make this up out of thin air when they talked this way. Okay? They're talking from their culture. They're talking from their education, from what they understand. This is a common phrase in, in, um, in traditional literature about before the foundation of the world, and this idea that before God even began creation, that there were certain things in his mind. There were certain things that he purposed even before creation. One of them, it is said, it is said that the name of the Messiah was known to God even before the foundations of the world. Now, for us who are believers in Yeshua, we would say, duh. <laughs> but... This is from a traditional viewpoint, an ancient viewpoint that says even before the foundations of the world, God was planning the Messiah. God was planning the coming redemption of the Messiah. God had him named. Okay? And that is something that we can relate to as believers in the Messiah, that before the foundation of the world, who was with him, Yeshua is God, He is with God, He is part and parcel of God's nature, He is the Word of God that is made manifest to humanity. Okay? He is the means through which God creates heaven and earth. But when He says this in verse 4, as He chose us, or as He chose the people of Israel in Him before the foundation of the world, so that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. In love, choosing holiness. Three buzzwords. Love, choosing holiness. Okay. This passage often gets interpreted as referring to um, a Christian idea of predestination. Okay? A, a Christian idea that, you know, God before time purposed that some people would inherit eternal life and others would not. He kind of set all that up before He ever created the world. And I would submit, based on what I'm learning, okay, based on the, uh, the sources that I'm reading, that really... Paul does not have this idea in mind when he's talking about God who chose us or chose the people of Israel beforehand, before the foundations of the world. I want to read to you now Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. This is Moses speaking on God's behalf to the people of Israel. Remember the three buzzwords. I got four fingers up. I need to fix that. Remember the three buzzwords, can you count, that I mentioned. Love, choosing, holiness. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a special people to himself above all peoples that are upon the face of the earth, the Lord did not set His love upon you or choose you because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and because He would keep the oath which He had sworn to your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So here I would submit, and you know, based on based on what I am learning, that Paul really is referring to this passage and to this idea of Israel's election before God, of Israel's being chosen as a set apart nation before God. 
Now he declares in Deuteronomy chapter 7, why did he do this? Because he loves them. He loves the nation of Israel. And also we find out that the nation of Israel is chosen for a purpose. Right? In Exodus 19, that they're a priestly nation through which the knowledge of God gets poured out upon the nations of the earth. Thank God that he chose a family to work through because he was thinking about us. Okay? He was thinking about pouring out the knowledge of God upon the nations and he uses a family to do that. A family that he loves for the sake of their forefathers. And Paul says that this choosing of Israel from before the foundations of the world, he did so in the Messiah, through the Messiah. Wow! That everything that God is doing in the beginning of creation, before time itself, everything he's doing, he's doing on behalf of his people Israel, before they're ever even created, and he's doing it through the Messiah. Wow! And not only that, but he's doing it for his people Israel with humanity in mind. That his plan for the redemption of the earth was put in place before time ever began. Before you made that mistake that you think about every night before you go to bed, God had that plan in place. Praise God. And I'll just mention this. This again, this is another traditional source, but it's just showing when I bring up these traditional sources, I do it purposefully to show that the writings of the apostles and how they think so oftentimes has a relationship with what the traditional understanding of the Scriptures is because they're Jewish people. They're religious, traditional Jews who believed in Yeshua. It was no contradiction for them. They didn't suddenly go to the school of Greek philosophy down the street and learn an entirely new way of thinking. They thought as Jews. Okay? And they applied their education and their upbringing and their understanding of the Scriptures. And that understanding was renewed okay, and brought to a new 2020 vision in the revelation of the Messiah Yeshua. But I'll read this to you. This is from a section of Midrash. This is a commentary on the scriptures. Rabbi Berechiah said, Heavens and the earth were created only due to Israel. As it is written, in the beginning, Bereshit, Reshit, the beginning, the Lord created the heavens and the earth. And Reshit is nothing other than Israel. As it is stated, Israel is sacred to the Lord, the first, the Reshit of his crop. Quoting Jeremiah 2, verse 3. Now this is just, this is a, a Torah teacher's, a rabbi's perspective on the scriptures, but it shows an idea that before the foundations of the world, God had his people Israel in mind. And he had them in mind and was already acting on their behalf through the Messiah Yeshua. That even his choosing of the nation of Israel was done through the Messiah Yeshua. This idea flies in the face of really 1600 years of what's called supersessionism, which is a big fancy word for replacement theology. Okay? This idea that God chose Israel for a time, but now since the Messiah has come, he's turned aside and there is a new Israel. And it's the church, the Christian church. No. God chose His people Israel from the foundations of the world and He did so through the Messiah. The Messiah was involved in that choice. And it's part of God's plan to sum up all things and to redeem the earth through His Son, through the Messiah Yeshua. So we're going to wrap up there this week. This is only verses 3 and 4. And as we go, I'm so excited to talk more about the blessings that Paul describes that have been poured out on the people of Israel and then also how Paul opens up and begins to see 
And now you also, the nations, you've been brought in through the pouring of the Holy Spirit upon you, that all these immense blessings that have been poured out upon Israel, you get to be brought near and become a fellow heir and a covenant partner in that. This is good news. <laughs> this is good news. There is a redemption that is still to come to this earth. And praise God, he's redeeming his people Israel. And because he's never forgotten his promises to them, he will never forget his promises to you. He's always faithful. So with that message of hope, we can go forward. I think we can be encouraged this week to know that God is working that he is not done, we can go forward this week and do the good deeds in this earth that we were created and safe to do with the knowledge that God's plan is working for his people Israel and for all of us for the good. So with that, will you join with me for just a